So, Dr. Jandial, thank you for being here. Uh, you are a world-leading specialist in neurosurgery, and in your practice, you have met over 10,000 patients, opened up so many skulls. <laughs> what can you say with certainty about the brain? What I can say with certainty about the brain is that we still have uh, so much to learn, and we're just catching a glimpse at how it works. We know a lot about the heart. We know about the joints. We're just starting to have the information necessary to know about the brain and that there aren't gears, there aren't wires, we're not hardwired, um, that there's this throbbing ecosystem of neurons, more like an electric garden of jellyfish with electrical currents moving through called brain waves with neurotransmitters and other minerals and ions floating through. It's a very dynamic state. In many ways, the brain you have tonight is not the brain you have in the morning. And I think that is uh, something that should inspire people that no, you know, no triumph is forever and no tragedy is forever, that we are in some ways new every day. Uh, th yeah, that's what you uh, say, that uh, there is a brand new day and everything is possible. Then why do we tend to stay stuck? In yeah, the habits. Months? Well, my explanation for that is uh, the brain is three or four pounds, maybe five kilograms, but maybe five, three, four, five percent of the body's weight, but it gets 20 percent of the blood flow. So it's a very metabolically active uh, organ. And so naturally, uh, to survive as it evolved over 30,000 uh, generations, not just 30,000 years, it learned to be efficient. It had to be efficient. Otherwise, it would consume energy and calories unnecessarily, likely during a time when those calories were hard to come by. So what happens is we don't, there's this myth about we only use 20% of the brain. No, we use every corner of the brain, but to do something, we may only use 20% at that time. It wants to be efficient in getting things done, whether it's tying your shoelace or getting to the store or taking the subway. And in that way, it builds patterns and habits for efficiency. Now, if those patterns and habits are destructive, those two also in get ingrained and imprinted and set uh, with certain circuits and myelination, which is a fatty coating of the neurons and their axons. Um, so bad habits, as well as good habits, tend to self-perpetuate. So switching between a bad habit to a good habit takes some energy, um, much like if, if there are certain grooves on a mountain where everybody's skiing down, that's naturally where the thoughts, the, the patterns and the habits tend to happen. To create a new habit, in the beginning, it takes quite a bit of effort. But once you create a new groove of thinking, it doesn't always require that same effort once you get that pattern set, a positive coping mechanism, a positive habit. Um, so we are new every day, um, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to take some effort to be the person you want to be. You were talking about uh, focusing and uh, 20%. And uh, now I can ask you about multitasking. Does multitasking really exist or not? So we have several, people say memory, um, but there are many types of memory. So there's procedural memory, riding a bike, tying your shoelace, and people with dementia or Alzheimer's, they don't lose that. Uh, there's autobiographical memory, the stories of our life. Every day we wake up after a dreaming mind and it's, we're connected, for most of us, to the events of our past, this autobiographical memory. Uh, episodic memory, that's remembering the episodes of the past, and there's also working memory. It's kind of a funky title, it doesn't really capture it, but it's how many things can you float in the front of your mind and juggle at the same time, multitasking. Mm -hmm. And that can be developed. The nuance with that is, if you have too many things going on, if you have too many things floating in your mind, you as an individual may, may get overwhelmed by that. But somebody who's cultivated that skill, maybe somebody who's in charge of a lot of people, maybe somebody who does a lot of different things, or a surgeon that looks at multiple monitors under stress, you can cultivate the ability to multitask. Each individual has to figure out where that dial is, that I have too many apps open in my mind, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, and I need to shave off a few because I'm not getting things done. Or, hey, I'm actually good at multitasking. I'm good at throwing a few ideas up in my mind. And ultimately, that's where creative thought also comes from is having different ideas, concepts, projects in your mind, 
all floating and allowing you to see the patterns that may connect them. So I don't think multitasking by itself is a bad thing. I think it's a unique ability that we can cultivate. I understand. Um, the world is going through hard times after a pandemic and with two wars ongoing. How does this affect uh, us and what can we do to cope? You know, I, I, I don't have an answer for that. I mean, I think that's a very complex question. Whether you're, I mean, I've operated for years, uh, not recently, but I was in Kyiv uh, many years, did surgery there on child, at a children's hospital. Um, so coping for those people who are at war or in the war environment might be different from us who are seeing it on television or on our phones. Um, but I will say that it's an individual thing, how we receive trauma and process trauma. I'm surprised pleasantly that as much trauma as the humans can, uh, as people that we endure or has afflicted us, we, I'm surprised we don't have more PTSD. So PTSD does not happen to 60, 70, 80% of people who have had trauma, big trauma, assaults, violence, suffering. It's still a small component. So I am optimistic that something uh, in our brains, in our minds, and the way that that system is built is actually quite good at dealing with trauma. And the question becomes, for those who are struggling with it, what are the coping strategies? Um, what are the ways that we can emotionally regulate what we're feeling? And I think we've talked about that earlier, but uh, removing yourself from excessive exposure obviously is one. Uh, two is you know working with a therapist to go over the traumatic memories in a safe environment. So you're removing the emotional stamp from them, a bit of exposure therapy. There are ways to have your traumatic memories be less traumatic without erasing the memory because memories are reconstruction. It's not a file pulled out. Um, so I want to leave people with optimism that if you have, if you're suffering and struggling with traumatic memories, whatever the origin, uh, that reshaping them and settling them in a less destructive emotional context is possible. Whether that works for this individual or that individual, I can't say, but I just want people to know that it's possible and then they can find their own journey to that. But does trauma affect our dreams? Oh, absolutely. Um, and can we heal trauma in our dreams? I, I don't have a... So does trauma affect our dreams? That's a m massive question about how our waking life feeds our dream life. And yes, traumatic experiences feed our dream life. In particular, as adults, they can create nightmares. So nightmares are sort of a psychological thermometer in adults, I believe. In children, there's something else, I think. They help shape the brain. Um, and can we heal trauma in our dreams? I'm not sure. And I think anybody who talks about dreams should say, I'm not sure, because who really can be? But I believe that some people have shown and some people have reported that dreaming about difficult things, such as divorce, can actually be those who dreamed or dreamt about divorce fared better with dealing with divorce afterwards. So there's this concept that there may be a dreams, maybe a nocturnal therapist dealing with emotions we can't during the day. I love the provocative thoughts, but yes, waking life feeds our dream life, not directly. And can trauma and emotional challenges be healed with your dreams? I don't know about healed, but the dreaming is a very hyper emotional state and a hyper reflective state. And I think it can go both ways. It can maybe exacerbate uh, certain things, but also improve certain things. I think actually I was wondering if it can act like an act of grief. Yeah, I mean, nobody knows, but I believe, uh, I believe dreams are serving a purpose uh, for our brains, for our minds, for our emotions, for our lives. They're not a side effect. They're not passive. They're vibrant. It's an active state doing something for us. And for some people, dreams help them deal and cope with trauma. Dreams are the topic of your latest book, uh, Why We Dream. What's something we don't know about dreams and you find out? Well, that's a very interesting. Okay, well, that's a, good, that's a great point. Um, I think we were thinking in the past, uh, 
And the dreams happen at certain times while we sleep, in REM sleep or other. And now as people are woken up at different times, dreams can happen at any time during sleep. So that means we might quite literally spend a third of our lives potentially dreaming. I think that's a power of upstate. That how do you look at the uh, the process of dreaming, the impact of dreaming, the influence of dreaming? So for to, for me to think about dreaming and get away from diseases, but to get away with this amazing mind that has some sort of system built into it that every night your mind might shut down, but something is happening with our dreaming mind for all of us. Uh, I think. I think that's captivating. It invites a lot of discussion. It leaves room for you to have your own dreams and understanding of your dreams. But I can tell the story of 10,000 dreams. Uh, what happened, your dream, wild, infinitely. I would never take that away or suggest otherwise. But when we look at 10,000 dreams, you start to see some patterns, uh, hyper-emotional, uh, not a lot of math or reading. And I'm trying to connect it to these 10, if you look at, centuries of dreams and dream reports in the last decade or 20 years can we take a look at brain patterns and brain activation and explain dreaming patterns with brain activation patterns um, that's where the neuroscience of dreaming is what i'm trying to tackle and not to give definite answers i mean you might say no i do math in my dreams all the time yes i believe you but when you look at 10,000 dreams very few people mention that and what happens during dreaming and brain activation is uh, they call it the DLPFC, just a fancy, fancy letters that explain the prefrontal cortex, the most front of the frontal lobes that pushed our foreheads forward towards the upper right and the upper left is where we get calculation and logic. Well, that's notably dampened in the dreaming brain. And now that fits with not doing a lot of math or reading when you look at 10,000 dreams. So that's what I'm trying to do is throughout the book is nightmares. What, why? I believe nightmares are needed. That's why I try to explain that. Erotic dreams. I mean, they arrive before the erotic act. It's an interesting order that the dreams come first. Um, but anyways, that's, you know, there is, what I love about it is there is no, there is no exact answer. And that leads to a lot of exploration and conversation and then people can take meaning uh, as it pertains to their lives. I was wondering if you uh, noticed you, those patterns, if the dreams are in colors or black. Oh, that's a great question. So um, before color television, they were mostly the black and white. It's a fantastic question. And the when color television... You are watching... Because the waking life feeds the dreaming life. Not directly. Not... Not in a straight line, but yes, when color television and color magazines came out, the reports of dreaming are more, significantly more in color. That's a, that's a fantastic question. So that's, that's exactly what I'm trying to do is explain what's happening in culture. Why, why, why across centuries in different cultures, from indigenous cultures to Asia, to, there's a certain number of people, they always report teeth falling out or falling in their dreams. So there's a pattern of dream types, this waking life feeds our dreams to a certain degree. And I think being able to think about it from a brain point of view, it doesn't take away from the mystery of dreaming. I think it makes it even more fascinating. Uh, in, in Romania, we have this superstition about the teeth falling. Mm -hmm. uh, when you dream that uh, your tooth is falling, that means that you'll die or something. Mm -hmm. So everybody, everybody has their own thoughts, uh, uh, but there are some, some dreams that happen throughout cultures and throughout regions, and we assign different interpretations and meanings to them, and I encourage everybody to do that. I'm trying to understand it from a brain science point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent questions. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for your time. I know you. Oh, are. no, didn't yeah. like that. I love <laughs> being here. <laughs> Vă mulțumim că ne-ați urmărit, sperăm că v-a fost de folos și vă invităm în comunitatea noastră a Societății Omului Sănătos.